It's Palm Sunday. So what's a Palm Sunday? What's with all the palms? What's with the donkey? What's with all the symbolism? These are all excellent questions, but a deeper question lies at the heart of this story. What kind of king, what kind of Messiah is Jesus going to be? Will he be strong and powerful, and will he use his power to bring judgment and destruction on those who deserve it? Or will he come humbly bringing peace and reconciliation? That's what we're talking about this week. Kindred UMC live show features adults discussing adult topics, occasionally with adult language. It may not be suitable for young viewers. Please use discretion before watching. Hello all, welcome to the Kindred UMC pre-recorded live show, coming to you not live but pre-recorded. My name is Chris Hayden, I am the pastor of Kindred UMC. I am Adam Holloway, I am a random dude here at Kindred UMC. And I'm Preston and I forgot a hat. Uh, in other news, uh, we had another, we had a family loss. So oh, I, wanted, no. I wanted to just generally reach out to those who have recently had loss, which I know we have a couple in our, um, in our close kindred family now. Yeah. Just like, remember, for real, for real. yeah, just remember it's, it's, it's super, super easy to kind of just blow it off and not think about it, but you gotta make sure you're, this is weird to say you're suffering correctly. Yeah. Make sure you're thinking True. through it. I'm with stuff, you. Stuff is happening. Yeah. So it's a rare, sincere tag from Preston. Yeah. Yeah. And to remember that when you're done through the suffering or almost done, there's a hand at the end of it waiting for you to grasp so you can have some help later. Yeah. Don't, but don't, don't avoid engage as well, best you can. And then also be, be kind to yourself. At, like if you need a break from it, go do something. Like you don't have to feel all your feelings all the time, but you also should not be avoiding all your feelings all the time either. Because they will come back. Yeah, they yeah, they will have a way of asserting themselves for sure. Well, thank you, Preston. That was that was a, a, a very lovely and sincere piece of advice for the real people out there. So thank you for being here. Uh, we are taking a break from our march through Genesis. Thank the Lord. Because, what do you mean, thank the Lord? Gen do you hate Genesis? No, I did not Preston say that. just said that he hated the Bible. <laughs> it went so, um, at zero to hundred real quick. Bill Collins, Collins is great. Bill Collins. Um, so uh, we are taking a break from our march through Genesis and we are taking a look at uh, Palm Sunday. Because because it's Palm Sunday. That's this, it it's not Palm Sunday today, but it will be Palm Sunday when this comes out. So happy Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week as uh, the free, the three worship boys uh, <laughs> know full and well. This is a, the, maybe the busiest week of the year for any worship musician person there is. Still don't know the song. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Holy Week, it goes from Palm Sunday all the way through Easter Sunday, and it has all kinds of stuff. We start with Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover, and also, even though he says it, his disciples are caught off guard, his death and resurrection, and, um, and then it covers Maundy Thursday, which is the, the first Last Supper, Good Friday, where he dies, Saturday, we usually don't do anything. We take that off as the Sabbath because that's what the original, uh, the people who loved Jesus would have done. And then Sunday is like Resurrection Sunday, Easter. So these are these are the most important moments in the Christian narrative. These are the most important. Like Christmas is great, but Easter is where it's at. Okay. And so we're going to begin that march through the Holy Week with Palm Sunday, and I'm reading from the book of Mark. It's in multiple Gospels, but we're going to look at the one from Mark. And this is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and they sound like this. When they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, he is Jesus, by the way, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, this, just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. 
They went away for, uh, and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them that, uh, what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches, palms, uh, leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then these who went ahead of the, uh, then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had lo looked around at everything, as it uh, was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Uh, so first of all, yeah. let's just start with what happened. What, what happened? Uh, Jesus came promise. to the city. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. freaked out. What's, does it, what city? Do you remember? Bethany. Starts with a J. It's the city. Jericho. No. Jerusalem. That's yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's correct. Jerusalem. Jericho. Yeah, no, Jericho. 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 Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> Jacksonville. <laughs> Where Jesus' second coming is coming out. Jacksonville, Florida. Um, oh, Jacksonville needs show. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, uh, no, yeah, uh, going to Jerusalem, and then what does Jesus ask his disciples to do? Go get a colt, which is a horse. Actually, it is a donkey. It's it's right. it's the a colt of the foal of it. It is a colt. you're not wrong. It, a colt is also a horse. Foal's a horse. Um, but a a colt, a foal of a donkey, like is the language that, ha and we're going to come back to that. That's actually not in this text though. He no. just says go get a donkey, basically. I almost right. said that on accident. Yeah. Um, it's their prophecy fulfilled. But colt is mentioned in the other. I, God, I may be wrong about that. While he's looking it up, I like to tie old things to new things. So like in modernity, because the city is so small compared to all of the U.S. It is. It does say cold. Yeah, yeah. It does say cold. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what, how do we? How would this happen now? Like if this were to like be copy and pasted into now and in this time and day, you know, inflation and deflation happens and everything goes through and we're all wearing. Well, before we can ask that question or answer that question, we have to understand just what the heck is going on in this scripture. Uh, so yeah, you're right. He gets he tells them to go get a donkey, basically a young donkey that's never been ridden, and then he rides in on that. So does that mean like a Corolla? And then but how do the people react? They are the overjoyed. They're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because yeah. it's a it's kind of like tapping at something that's been in the back of everyone's heads for a while. Like, it's this, an old, old prophecy. It, a, yes. It's about a 500, at this point, about 500 year old specifically, and then even more than that. But yeah. we're going to talk about the specifics of that prophecy in a minute. It's, it's like Area 51 actually being true. Like when it first <laughs> came out in the 70s or whatever. And in like 2470, they're like, guys. It's real. Yeah. Oh my God. They found another one and they're not keeping it from us. I don't know. They've, ju they've just published us. everything. <laughs> I guess they just don't care anymore. I don't know. Yeah. No, but they, yeah, they freaked out. The whole crowd was, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm probably going to step on one of your points and pause this. No, 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 go for it. It's literally the same crowd that turns on Jesus a week later and yes. calls for his death. Yeah, crowd, yes. Of it's no, it's the same, spoiler yeah, the same alert. city. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Gee, same we're trying group. to build a narrative here. Well, yeah, I uh, told you I was going to step on your ears. It is Jacksonville. It is Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> no, they freak out. They put their coats on the ground so I've he doesn't touch the floor. Story. They put coats on the donkey uh, and they, they welcome him with his open arms. of like. And the, the palms, which is where the actual name of Palm Sunday comes. Yeah. It's branches they were palm leaves and they're a sign of royalty that's what they would have done if caesar was coming in so like right. so part of part of palm sunday is a little bit of a political undermining message because all the people of jerusalem are treating this poor rabbi the way that they're supposed to treat caesar so there's a little bit of a pol political like undermining here yeah not but right. so here's here's so what do you make of him riding a donkey? It's it, comparatively speaking, it's 
with the whole Caesar thing, Caesar would have ridden in on a war chariot, most likely. Probably. Of like a gilded, the best war chariot. Yeah. Or at least a white steed. Like yeah. Or like yeah. Something, something so, amazing and perfect. Something like, super out there, regal. Yeah. yeah. And he comes in on a, a young falva donkey who has never been ridden before. For This is a peasant's... Probably not... The donkey, like, I don't know if anybody's ever read, uh, like, Rod Rodin uh, pack animals before. Oh, <laughs> ridden. ridden pack yeah. Animals. If anyone's ever roded uh, a pack animal before, <laughs> right it. Um, they have to be broken. They all have yeah. to be broken. Yeah. They don't like it when you get on until they learn, oh, this is what this, this is what I'm is. doing here, and, and this person actually likes me and will feed me. And... Well, stubborn as a mule or donkey. Yeah. Or the word ass, which means donkey. Yeah. It's the way we use the word. It's like yeah. being So it's probably it's probably a sloppy image. It's not like it's probably not going to go smoothly. No. You know? So okay. <clears throat> now not even like the keep. They're like, hey. The keep? We need Jet we need Larry over there. You mean like the Roman fort or whatever? No, the, the garrisons? Yeah, the, keep, yeah, the, the garrison. Keep. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> the Roman garrison? Yeah. The, keep, the keeper of the cult. Oh, the guy who oh, like yeah, actually well, owned the, the animal. A bunch of people yeah. were like, yeah. hey, what are you doing with that? And they were like, well, Jesus it's for said. for Jesus. Yeah, Jesus and said. They were like, oh, cool. Go ahead. Okay. He's going to bring it back, I promise. You know that's Larry, right? Yeah. He's... <laughs> He's... Your crotchety neighbor who does not. He He's does got not one like good eye out his donkey. He's got one good eye. He's got lips. Uh, no. So, okay. So the meaning here, in order to understand, so this is highly specific imagery. like, And all the gospels mention it. Highly specific imagery. Jesus is riding into the Passover, ultimately to face his death, his trial, his arrest, trial, death. And he does it in this very specific way. In order to understand what's going on, we have to go back to the Minor Prophets. So I said earlier, 500 years ago is when this imagery started. Mm -hmm. So 500 years ago, and this is, these are one of the rare uh, books in the Bible that we can actually like very accurately date because they give such specific information. Haggai and Zechariah. These are two Minor Prophets. They're, they're relatively short books compared. And they were written at, in 520 BCE, so about you know a little a little less than 500 years ago from when this story takes place. The the two books Haggai and Zechariah both talk about this coming Messiah. They both talk about God's coming back. Uh, Haggai in particular is talking about we have to rebuild the temple. Uh, we have to get things in order because God is coming and God is coming with a sword in his fist and he's going to defeat his enemies. He's going to bring judgment and vengeance and retribution. And he's, and he's going to be just a, a, a fiery sword bearing deliverer, you know, like he's going to bring defeat to our enemies. That kind of, that's the image that Haggai paints. Terrifying. Zechariah says something similar but he says it kind of in the opposite way. And the image from Zechariah that he uses to describe the coming Messiah, he will come humbly on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will come humbly to bring peace and reconciliation. These two books were written about the same time and circulated throughout Jerusalem around the same time. So fast forward 400 years now, four to 500 years now, that's what's in the air. There's this Jesus guy, by the way, the name Jesus is actually Joshua. It means Yahweh saves. So there's this rabbi who's an upstart, who's generated a crowd, who's traveling from place to place. He's done miraculous works and his name is God saves. And they're mm -hmm. like, Oh shit. Is this the one? Yeah, <laughs> like is this the guy that we is, is this it? Is this it? And one of the questions that they would be asking is how is he going to come? Is he going to come with a fiery sword in his fist? Oh, cool. Yeah. Or is he going to come on a donkey? And Jesus, who is a rabbi, knows all of these stories. No, and everyone else kind of knows all these stories. Jesus would know them by heart because that's how you become a rabbi. You memorize the Bible. Hmm. 
And he says to his disciples, as he's about to go face his death, and everyone's wondering, what's this guy going to do? What's going on? How is God returning? And he says to his disciples, go get the donkey. I will come humbly to bring peace and reconciliation, not judgment, not a fiery sword. I'm the kind of God who will come humbly. That's what this story is really about. Jesus Jesus isn't accidentally riding in on a donkey and then it happens to be fulfilling a prophecy. No, Jesus knows the prophecy. He's doing it on purpose. He's picked exactly what he's standing for. And, And the reason that's so important is because so many of the people would have wanted a revolution. They would have wanted violence. They would have wanted him to overthrow Rome. And instead, he comes in and says, no, I'm coming humbly to bring peace and reconciliation. The real question and the real thing that this story is about is what kind of God do we worship? So the question I want to ask you is, where do you need peace? And, you know, like, and this is so unfair because, God, I wish we lived in a different time where like the country was more divided or the church was more divided or our families were more divided because then this message would really land. You know, then we can have a real conversation, but we're all so unified and everything's going so well. Yes, we really is. don't need peace and reconciliation. It's not that bad. It's, <laughs> everyone's freaking out about nothing. Yeah. All the, yeah. All, there's no such thing as a divide in our nation or our po- politics or our country or our church. What a wedge our, in the world? Yeah. No. yeah. No. So, so that my question is, um, where do you want God to arrive this Easter season bringing peace and reconciliation. This personal or anywhere? Any, well, like, uh, yes. Preferably personal, but anywhere, absolutely. I can go first. I'm happy to go first because I've been thinking about it all day. <laughs> More than all day. I've been thinking about it for a week or so. Um, for me... The, the place where I really, really long for peace and reconciliation, um, the Methodist church has been fighting over liberal versus conservative stuff for a very long time, and most recently, specifically in LGBTQ inclusion. I happen to, my theology and my belief is that God absolutely created people who are LGBTQ and it is a natural, um, God loves wondrous variety and that is a beautiful part of the variety of our, of our creation. And also, I am concerned with how the very, very far left has been using LGBTQ as one community and one agenda to accomplish some kind of I think harmful things also. So what I really, really long for is is peace and reconciliation in those areas where we can love each other and be in relationship and not need to agree on our specific, like what does God think is good or bad? We can, we can, because the one thing that we know is that the, like God hates when people hate each other, <laughs> like, like we know that. So like, can we, can we accept that the person across from us disagrees with us, whether you're on the left or the right, can we accept and reconcile and make peace and have loving relationships with the people who disagree with us? Or does our love mandate the condition that you think the same way? I think that is sin and I think God hates that. I think God hates when we put those kinds of conditions on whether or not we will love and accept and be, you know, brothers and sisters with someone. If they don't agree with me, then I can't worship with them. Like, dude, you have missed the whole point of what Jesus is. That's a place that I just, and I've been, you know, it's been years and years now that, but I, it's a weekly, it's a weekly prayer for me. I pray, I, I try to pray every morning. I, sometimes I skip and miss and, you know, but like I try, I try well, to pray. Well, prayer doesn't have to be on your knees. It yeah. can be while you're driving in the car. 
Oh, Eastern Southern. Oh, no. Oh, no. Of course, because I know who that's from. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I try to pray every morning, and at least once a week, that is one of the things that comes up for me yeah. in prayer. Is like I long for peace and reconciliation in that area. But it's only a, a new recent thing that no one's ever asked for, ever. No one's ever wanted peace amongst everybody. No, of course not. No one's ever we need a little bit of a little bit of soil turn. Well, I, mean, well, I don't mind a little bit of challenge. Challenge is good. Challenge, challenge invites innovation and invites like necessity breeds invention. But there's a certain point of like when you have groups of people who are the the population of the world divided like that, and even within the same church. I work in a Methodist church and seeing the divide there, I hate it. Well, yeah, yeah you're I don't a, want, yeah, missing a key word, which is healthy. <laughs> like, there's, right. a healthy there's a healthy challenge. There's a healthy. We're on the same pedestal here, but let's let's debate if the pedestal is yeah. white or black. And we, but can, we're still here. And we can love each other and laugh through it. We can laugh our way through our disagreement. If if we won't like social yeah. contract. Well, like, I mean, <laughs> come this, on, guys. this is a little bit of Buddhism, actually. But like, if we can detach our identity, our identity should be in what God says about us, not our identity should be in what we think is true and right. Like, you're going to change your mind. Don't put your identity in what you believe is true. But Don't do that. You're going to change your mind. You're going to learn new things. It's why people argue. And it's why people get stuck yeah. Because of that exact point. I've only learned this, and this is all I'm going to learn. There's no way something's going to change that, because if I change from this, I'm going to freak out and jump into a sprinkler. Like, there's no... If you change me, I got nothing. And yeah. probably boils you, down to You luck. cease to exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just going to blip. And then I don't... And, and yeah. it's usually the fear of, I don't know where to go from there if I do change. I yeah. do like the identity thing, though, because that's kind of something that I've seen... A lot more in the world at my age and my groups of people that I know and, and look at and kind of watch. Also, because I help with the youth and so forth, so seeing it that like younger generation how it affects them is identity, the idea of identity, and how you feel one in the eyes of God and one in the eyes of society and yourself and like people around you, magazines, TV show, whatever it is. It's a huge conjecture like of, of differences. Where I mean, it's ma you're made in God's image, therefore you are perfect in that image. And yet there is everybody trying to change that, trying to make you the the better better looking woman, better looking guy, all this sort of stuff. And people hate how they look and feel how they hate how they look. That's just physical. Yeah, but there's there's like there physical as well as in, yeah. internal and like you yeah. look inside your head and, well, and I, think. I would say even, and, and this is tricky. This is, I, let me just confess my ignorance about this because you know, like I'm, I'm a white straight dude. I'm bald. like bald. I You're bald, sir. Bald. Um, I, I do think there is obviously there is something that is at the core of my sexuality is part of who I am and how I see myself. That makes a lot of sense to me. I think there is a disproportionate amount of emphasis placed on that's your identity and it's like yeah no no, no. Okay. i will stand next to you to defend your right to choose whoever you want yeah. to be in a relationship like i'll stay i'll i stand with everyone on that like hey man nobody's allowed to tell you like what you like like what you like like that that is gospel truth like what you like and also don't attach yourself so much to that that your whole identity and, and like personhood is wrapped up in that that one thing. Right. You know? Like you're you are more than who you want to have a relationship with and who you are remote romantically attracted to. You are more than what gender you identify with. You are more than that. And when we start to put our value and our identity on those things. I, and I understand what's going on there because it's a response to oppressiveness. I like that. Like it, I, I get that. That that I mean, oppression is is hard evil. It's like oppression is hard evil, and so I understand that it's a response to oppression. It's a response to evil. But also, be very careful about where you put your actual core identity. Like where you place that is very important, and like. And, and the thing about the Christian faith is your identity 
it goes all the way back to the first chapter of Genesis, where God says, you are made in my image, and you are very good. Like, that's your identity, period. Like, there's nothing, no yeah, right. Like, that's it, a full stop. You know, and everything else after that is like, wondrous variety is the phrase that I often use. Like, God loves wondrous variety. The, the unifying fact is you are a child of God, you are made in the image of God, and you are very good. <laughs> and God loves you more than anything else in creation. Like, and like, everything else is wondrous variety. And we just can't seem to get on the same page. We just can't seem to accept the like, oh yeah, so you, th okay, you think that's different. All right, I understand. You know, great. Like, let's, let's go to lunch then. You know, that, that's how I feel. And I just can't seem to get. I'm, I'm constantly arguing with people right. about, about it. It's also like the side of not necessarily like all that <clears throat> super deep stuff, but more surface level. It's, I mean, it's still deep in my brain, but like the idea of, of society being so focused on work and success and like all this stuff that is, is pulling well, you away from God. It's, it's the it's, same thing. Don't place your identity in what you yeah, accomplish. Same concept. Be, it's just, right. There's yeah. other, there's also other concepts that exist, Look, not I just this. this. Right. Yeah. There are other yeah, things. Yeah. It's like, not, it's not all in that one pot. There's yeah, many there's a lot of different, boiling. Uh, your attractiveness, over. your appearance. Yeah. Uh, we've got like 20 different pots on the stove and they're all boiling over. Yeah. Yeah. So get some lids <clears> and just kind of yeah. pull them off the heat a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just, <laughs> There's a fun little detail it's called a, a pronoun that you're putting before appearance and your attractiveness. There's your, which is already putting placement on whose it is. God. So to pull from the Genesis quote, establish you first. And if you can't even do that, we've, we've got issues. And that and you got to work on you first before you can start working on other people's gardens. And that was kind of my point I was going to make of if I want people to be at peace, I want people to be at peace. You have an inner garden, you have an Eden. If you want to like, you know, connect those two, a place where you feel safe and you can be with you. You don't need someone else to come and help. There's your everything's tended to, and you're ready to either branch out or flower or just sit and enjoy like what's going on. I have to say, and I, I think a lot of people don't know that, or they're too they got too many things going on, and they don't have enough time to sit and pray in the morning or meditate for five seconds or just kind of sit and think because there's too, there's too much going on outside the walls that you can't well again I, and i think that busyness the too much outside i think a lot of times that comes from people trying to prove their worth and, and we you know we live in a competitive kind of like socially economically like we have a competitive but which I like, I like that, but it can go sour when it turns into com compete at all costs kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, and the amount of times it does, your your brain tries to think it's more than okay to accept that it always is gonna go sour and that causes a distrust in others. What we're supposed to know and learn from Jesus is that everybody is innately good and has some kind of again, with the metaphor of the garden that you're tending to. And if you're good there, you can tell if others aren't. And that's kind of why, like, these weird people have these, like, I can see your aura and I can see how you're... It's because they've tended to their garden already, and it's probably why they sound weird to you, because you're very distrustful of, like... When you, I, can, when you can center into who you actually were created yeah. to be, things look different. Yeah, given it's you seem goofy or you seem different or you seem like you're going to get mm -hmm. prosecuted weird tie into another story that's gonna happen you're, you're gonna be like <laughs> when, you're, when you're arrested for no yeah, reason yeah. maybe, and maybe put up on a cross <laughs> for some reason <laughs> that you had to carry like four miles yeah <laughs> and after, after you whip and crown put on your head and made yeah. thorns there's a, yeah, there's yeah. a reason it's yeah. said it's because it's, it resonates with everybody and there's a reason you're upset about i don't get it and that's why i'm upset and a lot of other people don't and that's why we're all upset is because no one's kind of explaining it to us in the best way for some reason, be it, give it the LGBTQ thing, or Close the economy, or why isn't everyone getting along on the road, or why is the dog half dead? Like, I don't. No one's explaining this stuff to me, perfect. and it's freaking me out. And I don't trust anything now. And now I'm gonna lash out because it's not fair to me. 
So, all right. So, because we're close to, we're out of time, basically. And that's what I want peace with. Um, well, that, well, that's the thing. Like the so, the call of Palm Sunday. Everyone's cheering. It's a celebratory. It's like a it, traditionally, it's a big celebratory, like bombastic kind of Sunday. The worship services that I've been a part of have always been like really like enthusiastic and we wave palm branches and we sing songs and even churches with a lot more resources literally have a guy ride in on a donkey. Well, like I've been to those I've churches, seen that, yeah, you know? It's been, it's been <clears throat> it's but crazy. here's the thing. Let's not get caught up in the pomp and circumstance. Let's recognize and take to heart internally what is being celebrated. The thing that's being celebrated is it's not just God has come and seen us and met us in our need. It's also the way that God is coming to see us and returning and meeting our needs is through peace and reconciliation. And we are called to participate and be people of peace and reconciliation. So wherever you are with your like, I just can't stand this. I just can't stand those people. I just can't stand people who think this. I can't get along with anyone who does this. I can't, you know, whatever that is, do the work. Look inside of yourself. And I want to say very clearly, Jesus has come to bring peace and reconciliation to that exact thing that just absolutely tears your butt up. With that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace and reconciliation. Amen.